Thank you so much, Chairwoman Stabenow. It's great to serve uh, with you on this committee and uh, it's an honor to be at my very first agriculture committee hearing uh, under your leadership. Uh, my home state of Georgia uh, has a diverse agriculture economy uh, leading the country in poultry production. We're also a high producer of cotton, peanuts, fruits, and vegetables. Um, it's also the home of a large number of black farmers and other farmers of color who have historically suffered discrimination at the hands of the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm proud that the American Rescue Plan Act includes many of the provisions uh, that I put uh, together uh, to begin the process of addressing this discrimination, including debt forgiveness and new investments. Uh, but indeed, we have to do more of these farmers because of disparities rooted in our racial past, exacerbated by COVID-19, are struggling just to stay afloat. Mrs. Smallhouse, you noted in your testimony that policy which addresses proactive measures to influence climate conditions cannot be one size fits all. Uh, I agree with you uh, there. Can you or anyone else on the panel talk about uh, equity, talk about the importance of ensuring that farmers who have faced historical discrimination are included in these policy conversations related to climate change and agriculture. How can these farmers, particularly those who have uh, small scale uh, or operated uh, to the climate change solution, even while struggling to, uh, to stay afloat? Well, Senator, I would be happy to answer that. Um, thank you for that question. You know, the fact is, is that, you know, one of the reasons that I'm involved in Farm Bureau is because we, with no disrespect to other agricultural groups, we are one of the most inclusive and transparent organizations that exist. Um, we have lots of, of policy which tries to promote farmers of all ethnicities, all types, traditional farming, organic farming, urban farmers, rural farmers. And I think that any discrimination that has happened within the USDA or anywhere else, anywhere else in the past is an absolute tragedy. And the fact is, is that um, Farm Bureau at all levels, from the county to the state to the national level, is ready to step up and fight for those farmers and ensure that that does not happen um, within the federal government or anywhere else. Um, American agriculture is strong because of our diversity, our diversity of thought, our diversity of types of farming, our diversity of agriculture. So I think that any programs that we talk about for carbon sequestration and environmental stewardship should be open and available to anyone who is a steward over our natural resources, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or what they're farming. Okay. Thank, thank you for your response. It, it's certainly true that uh, historically disadvantaged farmers have to be centered uh, in our policy around uh, addressing the issue of climate change. And uh, I look forward to working uh, with you in the future uh, to ensure that. I'm looking for the clock. It looks like I've got a few a few more minutes. Um, yes, you do. Yes. Mrs. Whitman uh, Stitt, your testimony noted that uh, technical and economic barriers often discourage and limit the adoption of climate smart practices. Uh, additionally, uh, Mrs. Smallhouse asserted that the 1890 uh, land grant institutions, uh, which are HBCUs, have served as an invaluable resource in developing new technologies for our farmers to implement. We've got uh, land grant institutions in Georgia, uh, including uh, Fort Valley State University. Uh, the agriculture research and co cooperative extension activities happening at these at, at these universities are a lifeline uh, for farmers in Georgia. Um, could either of you speak to this question? What are the barriers uh, farmers face when attempting to adopt climate smart practices? And how can our cooperative extension service in Georgia help farmers overcome these barriers? Um, 
Yeah, if I may, I would I would be glad to speak to that. Cooperative extension is extremely important at our land grant universities. I know here in Arizona, in the Southwest, um, in New Mexico, we have uh, desert ag centers and cooperative extension experimental ranges. I'm sure you have something similar in the Southeast. So funding for ag research, which I stated in my testimony, is absolutely imperative for this effort moving forward. You know, we need to find crops that grow faster and stronger in shorter growing seasons. That's one of the challenges for cover crops. We need to to uh, find better technologies for irrigation and uh, holding that water in the soil. So that would just be a couple of things and I don't want to monopolize the time so I would uh, then throw it to uh, Ms. Whitman Stitt. Absolutely and thank, thank you Senator, for that question. Um, as, I, as I mentioned we do quite a bit of on-farm research just to kind of figure out what's going to work in our growing area. So what we've discovered is that what works on one end of the farm may not work on the other end let alone in the next county or region. Um, these can be really costly experiments. We still have to pay the rent on the ground, whether or not this cover crop experiment works or not. Um, so the bottom line is we really just need more robust research to help develop these practices and get that information into the hands of producers that are Im implementing them on their on their farms. And that research needs to you know, span the country and, and cover diverse growing regions um, to really get the, that information in the hands of producers. Thank you very much.